Welcome to the Golf Fitness Bomb Squad podcast with Chris Finn, a production of P4S Golf. Welcome to the Golf Fitness Bomb Squad. I'm your host, Chris Finn, and I am really excited today. We have a wonderful guest, the actual, our first uh, guest where we're actually going to get to get into the mental side of the game. Uh, we're So we're taking a little bit of a break from the physical side, which I'm excited about, uh, because to me, this is any anybody who has tried to play competitively, who has even just tried to win money from their friends, there always comes a moment when your brain sucks. And so <laughs> uh, we have Rick Sessenhaus with us today. Rick, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you on. How are you doing today? I'm uh, doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, so Rick, how do you get into the mental side of golf? Like, yeah, you know, my journey on the physical side was kind of a, one of starting from the ground up. Like, you know, I just worked with anyone and anybody who might listen to me. And if they didn't, I just <laughs> bugged them until they said, just all right, I'll do it. Just leave me alone. Uh, right. Like, like, how did how did you get to where you're at right now? Because I mean, the the resume is is impressive. Oh well, well, thanks. I think part of it. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, I was I was a golfer starting about the age of thirteen. Uh, average junior golfer ended up get uh, getting better and playing golf at Cal State Northridge, a Division One school here in uh, the Los Angeles area. So I got I got better certainly with the me mechanical skills and you could hit a ball and all those type of things. And, and yet, so my journey in the mental game was more of my own downfalls of a hothead frustration, throwing clubs, uh, those type of things. Attitude was horrible. And then when I got into coaching, you know, I just thought, well, that was just a me thing Yeah, you know, that was just me being a hothead. But as I've started working with better and better players, you know, certainly on their golf swing, I'm a, a member of the PGA and I've touched golf swing for 30 years. I started seeing that there was a lot of interference, a lot of stuff getting in the way of them. What I thought was to perform at a higher level. And I'm a coach. Right. I'm supposed to, they're supposed to shoot lower scores and they're not. And yet their swing looks better. And on the range, it looks pretty and they're hitting the shots they want. And so that's when I think I really started to pivot and learn more about performance from a standpoint of the mental side, emotional side. And we'll talk more about what that is in a moment. But, you know, as, as I look at it, I think it's a puzzle piece of many puzzle pieces that uh, uh, performance is obviously the physical part. I 22 years ago, I worked for a company called Body Balance for Performance. That was before mm -hmm. TPI. And, yeah. and so I started to understand in the structure of the body governs the func function of what it could do. And yeah. I was fascinated with that because as a swing coach, I was early on in my career, I was too much of a system coach. Like everybody okay. has to yep. swing a cer certain way. And mm -hmm. then you, and unfortunately I was working with a lot of great athletes, so it made it a little easier, but it, <laughs> it, it wasn't a great teaching method because right. not everybody, not everybody had even close the same structure. Right. Right. Yeah. But my fascination with, was with more of the performance end of when somebody's at the golf course, uh, what, where's their focus going, their confidence or emotional regulation, those type of things. And so I went back to school and, and got a doctorate in applied sports psychology. I've gone down some big rabbit holes with um, other parts of that, uh, which is like positive psychology, flow states, mm -hmm. those type of things. And I've been fortunate to work with a lot of really, really good players along the way. Uh, learned a lot from them because you, you, if you ask them good questions, you're going to get some great answers. Go, oh, I never thought about it that way. And you start seeing everybody's different, just like in their physical that makeup. You have different personalities. You have different learning styles. You have different ways of what triggers uh, a, a great performance, what triggers a poor performance. So right. that's a little bit of a nutshell, kind of where I came from. I came from a player's perspective first and what I needed. And then yep. as a coach looking at that, I wasn't seeing results. And then if I really asked the proper questions, I started to hear from these players that, you know what, I'm getting nervous out there. I'm getting stressed out there. Right. I have a lot of doubt over shots. I got fear over shots. And at that time, I didn't really have great answers. So yeah. that's when that's when I kind of pivoted. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's that's funny listening to the there's a lot of parallels, I think, in how at least on the physical side, we like very much system. I just do what this on everybody. And then you start to realize, hey, wait, uh, actually, that doesn't work for that person. Why is that? Right. So I guess so. talk to me. And, and I think also on the physical side, you know, particularly, you know, on the on the physical therapist side, which is after you know, I was strength coach and then the, the PT side, too, like on the physio side, if, if you don't ask the right questions, it's tough to get the right diagnosis. So it's very similar mentally, it sounds like. So I guess there's a lot of people that I see, I get this question all the time, like golfers will come in and, like, hey, who's a good mental coach that you recommend? 
And it's, it's like, uh, well, there's a lot of people that say they're mental coaches. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, like, so how does somebody go about like, and maybe this just comes into a little bit, you chatting a little bit about the questions that you've started to ask and, and kind of what you've learned along the way. Like, obviously you're one of the top guys out there. So how does somebody, a regular amateur listening right now, like differentiate between you and I mean, I literally had a woman come here. I'll tell the story. I'm not going to use names, but I had a woman locally. She came. I was probably only maybe five, six years in. I was just looking for some sort of member event to try to get leads in, like trying yeah, to pay yeah. the rent. Right. So I have her come in. She says she's got this big, fancy resume. She shows up and we probably I probably got like 20, 30 people in the room. Right. And there's juniors and there's adults. And she has two juniors up there with like blow up swords, like like you would get at like a carnival. Right. And she has like, and she has them like slicing away their fears. And, sli- and I'm like, oh my God, this is awful. Like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. And everyone's like looking at each other. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. So this is a good learning experience. Don't just let anybody come in the door. So how does somebody protect <laughs> themselves from getting into that situation <laughs> Woo! Uh, versus okay. somebody who's actually going to help them? Yeah. I mean, it's a loaded question. And, and let me answer it first from a swing standpoint. A lot of yeah. golfers out there, not a lot of, even, excuse me, not a lot of golfers even take golf lessons, mind right. you, much less mental game. So I understand yep. it's a small percentage, but even if you take golf lessons, you're looking for somebody who has some experience. Now experience mm-hmm. could be, again, I was a full-time teacher giving 50 hours worth of, of golf lessons per week. You start doing the numbers after five, 10 years. That's a lot of experience. Now, yeah. that's a lot of bad lessons I gave the first few years. Yeah. Totally. But if you have somebody who only gives four lessons a week because they are already working in the pro shop and stuff like that, yeah. you got to be careful. Their learning curve is is still way out there. Correct. Um, yeah. Also getting mentored. I was I was mentored by some of the best coaches growing up. I was been mentored by some great mental game coaches. So now you're gathering their information. And you're you're getting to tap into their experience, and then yes, I think you should have some education. Uh, I'm not saying somebody has to have a doctorate or a master's degree, but there has to be some level of understanding cause and effect. And um, I've gotten really now into the science based part of it. So yep. uh, I use brainwave um, EEGs, I use heart rate monitors, um, I use a, a new thing with blood flow to the prefrontal cortex because we want to be able to prove these things work. Yep. Um, and we also want to have a basis of what is triggering, um, these different emotional responses and stuff like that. So I think you have to have some education behind it. Um, yep. experience. I, I know some mental game coaches who don't have high level degrees and they're fantastic, uh, yep. because they do ask better questions mm-hmm. and they are willing to learn about the, the person. Um, and I think we, as, as mental game coaches have to remember that the player is coming to you. They're vulnerable. They're like a mental game coach. That must mean I'm screwed up. But, uh, but it really, sh- <laughs> but it really shouldn't be. It should be that it's right. part of performance, right? You have people that maybe come in their high level athletes that you screen them and you go, well, they check all the boxes on the basic screen, but guess what? They still want to get faster. They still want to be more, have more endurance. So mental game is the same thing. Um, and so I would say with the mental game coaches, I think you got to be careful if they have zero experience in sports. You're seeing a lot of clinical psychologists who who look at and go, oh, that sports stuff looks pretty cool. And yeah. they don't know the verbiage. They don't know the communication. They don't know what they're going through. So I think yeah. somebody who's coming to it from a standpoint of they have understand sports, it doesn't have to be necessarily golf. That That's very, very, very helpful. Yeah. Um, and I think being willing to, um, again, have some form of a plan. Like I have a basic assessment and I have a, you know, here's some things you're going to do. Here's worksheets. Here's actual training. You know, part of my yeah. company flow code, we have a whole portal where you're doing certain meditations and breathing rates and, and certain things. We're actually training the mental game. I don't want yeah. somebody to come and go, oh, I had this nice conversation with Rick. Okay. I want somebody to wait, say, hey. Wait, you mean you actually measure things and then look for improvement? Oh, That's a wild no. concept, right? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so so it's one of those things where, you know, when I first was a mental game coach 20 years ago, I was still trying to find my feet. Don't get me wrong, but I've learned along the ways of what are we measuring, right? Some of it's subjective in the mental game. Yeah. Honestly, you're doing yeah. journaling, you're doing open-ended questions and stuff, but now technology's catching up. Um, we have some cool ways to help people um, with feedback, neurofeedback, and all that of like, oh, wow, you mean I did that breathing rate? 
And then I noticed my brainwaves went down. Oh, I have some control over my situation. So I I want to empower the player. I also want to give them different options. So like uh, this would be one like with visualization. Like I used to, everybody has to visualize. I found out some people are more feel oriented. We call it a deep embodiment triggers. More people are going to be in their body, body connecting to target. Other people are going to see it. And then if you see it, should we see a shot tracer? Should we, I see a bullseye in the distance? There's a, so, I mean, there's all kinds of different right. visualizations too. Right. So we want to, we want to open up that there's a lot of different solutions to, to somebody's performance. So again, back to the thing, a mental game, they have to have experience. Um, I think communication is important. Um, I feel I I've seen a lot of coaches that are pretty good in one-on-one, but then you put them in a group and it's disaster. Um, yeah. And so how do you get your message across in a very um, simple way too? the mental game, you can go down roads and like, you know, I ask everybody, what is the mental game? And I hear everything, right? And that's fine because at yeah. least they're trying, oh, it's positive thinking. <clears throat> it's this great that it's all that's true. Yeah. But if I say it's about state management and it's about your, your mental, emotional, physical state, as you execute a golf shot, they're going, okay, what's state management? I go, well, what are you thinking? What are you yeah. feeling? And then how is that going to respond to your actual physical makeup, mm-hmm. stress response, grip pressure could increase. My speed yeah. could increase, and then you blame your golf swing, or you blame yeah. your P, you blame your PT. You don't want to be blamed yeah. for that. That's yeah. a, nope. That was a mental error, you know. Yeah, no, th- yeah, no thanks. <laughs> and, we, and we get that all, the, and we'll we'll see that, right? I mean, this is just, I mean, it's nothing you don't already know. Like we'll have guys come in, and you know, we do the test, and this is probably to me for anybody that's like trying to do anything physical, you have to have, in my personal opinion, and also just I think science, you need, I think people need to engage with with the mental side because. There's so many times where we'll get a player to like, you know, they pass all their mobility is great. All their strength numbers are in the top 5%. All their power numbers are in the top. And like uh, we had a, a, a young, a young woman, she was kind of like fringe. She would be on uh Symmetra and then she'd be on like LPGA. She'd go back yeah. and like, and it was like, when you tested her, she was the absolute by far the best female athlete we've ever seen, but just it was between the ears. She just couldn't execute when it was out there. And I always see this all the time with guys that'll come in, like just amateurs. And they're like, Oh, I'm feeling great. My game still sucks. And it's like, <laughs> it's like well, what do you mean? It's like, well, when I'm up by myself. I play great. But when I go out to the, the weekend game, I keep having to pay money. Right. And so just to like, to your point, and, and we've seen, you know, there's obviously the science you probably know better than I do. of like, when you do have those stress responses, it does cause physical change. Like you said, like the grip may change and, and you can do all the physical prep in the world, but if right. we are missing this element, you're not, it's not going to be optimized. Definitely. And I think that's what I've even tried to simplify my model even more is that my goal is to take somebody from a fear state to a flow state. And, mm-hmm. and a fear state is triggered by an anxious thought of the future, a threat. Oh crap. Right. I don't like this hole. Oh no. I made double on this hole last week. Oh no, right. let's not mess up. I don't want to embarrass myself in front of other people. Yeah. If that thought is not um, you know, looked at or changed, it will have an emotional response, which now physically I could go fight or flight. Now the fight right. in somebody would be grip pressure increases. They steer the ball. Don't go left. Don't go left. Right. And they yeah. steer it. Okay. Yeah. Now that's changed all their dynamics. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you have a flight, which is what I used to do under pressure, which is I'm uncomfortable. Let's just get this thing over with as quickly as possible. My golf swing got short and fast. I hooked yeah. the ball under yeah. pressure. Okay. Now I could hook a ball, go back to my swing coach. Oh, see, I'm hooking it again. I got to fix that. And then within two swings, somebody's striping in and all their track man numbers are exactly what they want. And the, the swing coach is like, um, I'm not sure what to do, right? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. because the player is not being honest, saying I was yeah. really nervous on the shot. They're just saying, oh, it's a swing fault because mm-hmm. I'm hooking again. But if yeah. we went a deeper, it's like, well, what state were you in? Well, I was petrified because I don't want to go right like I did yesterday in this water. So I felt uncomfortable. Oh, now we're getting to the actual cause and effect here. Now from right. there, what do we do, right? I mean, then we could talk about pre-shot routine and how to you know shift, um, you know, we call cognitive reframing. How can I look at this differently? I can certainly do breathing in the, in the moment to regulate some of that stress response. Uh, but a flow state is about being fully immersed in the present moment, looking at the shot instead of a threat, but looking at it as a challenge. Now we take on challenges mm-hmm. and, and then yes, we, we can look, do I actually have the skills to match the challenge? Right. That's our confidence question. Yep. And if we say, yeah, then great. 
and I can recall great drives I've hit. We all have. Wonderful. Yeah. I'll bring that to now the forefront instead of, oh, crap, don't go right like I yes- yeah. did yesterday. And so it's a lot. Certainly, it's about a lot about uh, managing the, w- what's triggering in, in our environment. And if we can get more aware of those times we're uncomfortable, there's probably some form of a pattern there. It might be water's all right and you tend to fade a ball. Okay, that would be a pattern that would trigger something or a six foot downhill left to right putt where it's to win a skin that may trigger a different response. I want to know what's triggering different states. Okay. But then on the other end, I want people to understand when they've played their best, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are they doing? There might be some a thread a recipe there that we could start to um copy and we can start to repeat and then people talk about pre-shot routines all that stuff great but i'm talking about really deep into those pre-shot routines of what was triggering that so i'm looking at most people let the environment trigger an emotional response i want us to train our internal environment so it doesn't matter what i am outside i'm still having that focus and that confidence and that calm as i execute a golf shot so it's funny as you're as you're talking about all this i'm thinking last week i was on a, a call i was on the golf course and like more i was listening i didn't really have to be involved except every once in a while maybe unmute and say something it was three under on the on the front nine and then I, I i played the other day just you know competitive i think i hooked two into the woods i think i shot like five over on the front nine i think maybe i just need to <laughs> stop thinking <laughs> just get over and just hit the ball like that oh, yeah. <laughs> But I was going to say a lot of that, like the don't thinking is an interesting one, because when I ask people what the mental game is, they say, oh, it's about not thinking. I said, well, I, I disagree because I believe a great part of the game is thinking. When I get to yeah. a second shot in a par four, I'm going to I am going to look at the lie and how the ball is going to get affected by the lie. And I'm going to look at wind and I'm look at how firm that green is. I'm going to yeah. there's a lot of thinking happening at the right yeah. time. Correct. And yeah. then we transition into, you know, now the cliche thing now to say is be an athlete. Well, be an athlete means I want to be reactionary to a right. target and, yeah. and not have the interference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a thinking part, definitely at the part of first part of the pre-shot routine. And then there is a shifting of reacting as an athlete to a target. And that's where people need to work out a little bit. Clearly me as well. But so <laughs> let's, so I'm curious. So one of the big things that that I'm passionate and just really believe a ton in is assessing and not guessing. And that's clearly something that you that you do as well. So just to like to give listeners kind of an idea of like they go to to flow code, like what are the things that that you look at? Like like when you like not necessarily what do you do with them, but like what's what's an assessment? Like what are the things types of things like for for us? How's their rotary mobility? How's their upper body sure. power, the lower body, right? Like, sure. like, what are the stuff that they should, that when they go to flow code, which all of you should, by the way, PS, uh, <laughs> um, what, what is like, what's something that they should like, that you're going to be looking at with them and that they should expect? Right. Yeah. So a lot of my clients are on zoom and, and over, you know, all over the world. Yeah. And, and so I'll answer this two different ways. All of my students, whether I see them in person or, or in virtual environment, are going to fill out a five to six page mental assessment. Now, mm-hmm. it's a very subjective. They're filling at open-ended questions. I'm, I'm asking them about goals and motivational styles and practice habits and how do they prepare for tournaments and um, focus and confidence, emotional. I'm, I'm, I'm giving them some frameworks of some of the skill sets we will work on, mm-hmm. but I want to get there at least what they think their baseline is. They've never been asked a 90% of these questions, by the way. So oh, sure. <laughs> just just the exercise of filling it out is an actual training exercise right? because yeah. they go, I never thought about when I play really well, what's going on, or I don't even know how my practice is anymore. I mean, and, and so they said, this was really valuable. I go, great. Now, again, that's not scientific and all this stuff, but it's a subjective way for them to start to measure where they're at and where we want to go. And then if I see somebody in person, we call it a mindset fitting. I use some different technologies to, that. That's awesome. and, and I don't do it necessarily in the first session, I'll be honest with you, because I think there's so much stuff that needs to be kind of filtered away. Yeah. But once we get to that idea of what are we actually training, we're training state management. Then I look at what the interferences are. The interferences could be distractions. They could be doubts. They could be fears. They could be certain situations, right? And then we look at, okay, how do we make those shift? So with flow code, we have different triggers and different, we believe there's different paths for everybody, your own flow code, but the player needs to be more aware of what are those skills in the first place. Remember, most people have never seen a mental game coach. 
They vaguely, vaguely think they know what it's about, but usually they don't. So there's a lot of education at the start of it. What is the mental game? These are the things we're going to work on. Focus. Are you paying attention to the correct cues? And can you keep your focus on what's relevant in that moment? Oh, Rick, I get distracted by my iPhone. I got a texting all the time and I'm thinking about what I don't want. Well, we might want to start focus then. Yeah. (laughs) There's there's a key thing. Flow follows focus. The only way to be in a peak state is to be fully immersed in the present moment. Okay. We usually start with that. Then we get confidence. You know, do you believe you have the skills to match the challenge in front of you? If some people say, well, yeah, on the range, but now not on the golf course. We have a disconnect there and we start we start talking about confidence and then emotional regulation is a big one. Um, I do a lot of stuff on post shot routine. What mm-hmm. happens after a golf shot? Most people are very reactionary, very critical, very judgmental. And I'm looking at, well, let's be curious. Let's learn. Um, it's not about positive thinking, but it's about, hey, I hit the ball left. I would want to know why it went left. Yeah, Most sure. people blame swing. I say, well, were you even fully committed to the shot in the first place? And they go, oh, what does that mean? Well, do you have a clear tar- clear target? Well, no, because I want, didn't want to go right. And I go, well, okay, right there. We got a uh, lot. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of it's education. A lot of it's me asking questions, me trying to, um, we certainly put them through pre and post shot routine. Um, but the measurement starts to occur more and more and more. Um, we do, you know, on somebody's scorecard, we may have a different process goal. Um, okay. Every time that you feel your emotions are getting to frustrated level, we're going to do a post shot routine, you know, and, and we have very precise what the routine's about, not just, Hey, did you do your pre-shot routine? If it's Rick, I'm going to work on visualization to get more clarity on my, uh, on my pre-shot routine. That would be a specific process that we are working on. Now we have a feedback loop. Did I do it or not? And at what, mm-hmm. uh, clarity and stuff, those, so it, it gets a little tricky because it's definitely not one size fits all. Right. I do personality styles and all kinds of stuff too. So, um, yeah, the assessment part is a lot of subjectives of a lot of questions, a lot of people now thinking in new ways that they haven't thought about before. Yeah, so for all of you listening right now, if you go ha- have gone to a mental coach or do go to somebody and they don't do all that, go some flow code. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> go see Rick. But, but I, I just think I'm so passionate about that because there are so many people in our space, in the fitness space that like, you know, oh, it's golf fitness. Let's do golfy things. And they don't, the big, big passion, the whole reason why we are where we are is because we test everything. And it's like, we know that 90% of the stuff that people test right now, it just doesn't matter. Like literally 90% of stuff that matters is can you rotate? Can you, how much lower body power, upper body power? And like, and then let's, let's figure out what you're trying to do. Right. And right. so I, I just, I love hearing that that's occurring on the mental side of, of the space as well, because that's so important for people to assess, know exactly what it is that you need to do there's listening to you talk there's so many different ways that somebody listening could go right <laughs> whether it's visualization or it's focus pre shot routine right? and so i think that's the importance of somebody like yourself and a program like floco to help people kind of cut through the noise and say hey this is what you need to do this is what's the most important and uh i know in the fitness space uh for golf golfers hate the gym so our whole mission has been how can i get the minimal effective dose because <laughs> if it's more than 90 minutes in a week that's we've got it based on our science where it's like if it's at least 90 minutes if you give me 90 minutes i can guarantee we're going to get to where you need to go and like 15 minutes a day you can't tell me you can't do that for five days in a week right like but so i think that's it's so important on the mental side too because i think it's very easy to feel like you're getting hit in the face as an amateur with a water like a fire hose of information to- totally and I, and i'm glad you said that is because one i know when somebody's coming to me for mental game um, I, I get one or two type of players. I get the serious player who's competitive who says, Rick, I want to try this. I think it's important. Most of the time it's I'm broken, fix me, right? I'm screwed up yep. mentally. I'm now again, that's like, that's work- like what we get too. Like, <laughs> like, where were you three six months ago when I told you your hip didn't rotate? Well, I felt fine. Now my now I can't play because my back's gone. It's like, well, I'm glad you came now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So so but along those lines is that I could fire hose them with all this material that I have and all this kind of stuff. But we do want to get back to, you said it perfectly, right? The minimum dose to still get somebody progressing. And that's why with, with flow code, we have um, something called a flow club. It's basically a mind gym. So we, we have these breathing rates and these meditations. We actually have coaches that are doing them live in our, in our app. Uh, throughout the day so people can understand how to do a proper breathing rate, how to do a visualization, how to use their body. See, this is what's cool. 
you can use body to get into a flow state big time. Movement is very important. Uh, one, just all the neurochemicals that go through you. But in order to focus, to do the exercise correctly is a mental process, right? Yeah. Um, and so we want people to do five minutes of day of maybe some box breathing, or maybe they're going to spend five minutes in the car before they go play. And we have these guided meditations for the visualizations of how they want to show up on the first tee. So we want to do it in small type of things. Okay. Or here's journalize your best shots that you hit today, right? That may take two minutes. Great. Yeah. So I agree with you is that how do we get it into a habit though? Right. right. And the, yeah. the habitual part of it to where they go, that's, I love doing this stuff now because it helps me on the golf course. It helps me deal with stress at work. It helps yeah. right now. It becomes part of who they are. Yeah. Even the physical side, I'm playing better golf, but man, I can get around better. I can, I'm not <laughs> hurt when I wait. We, we want to link more of those benefits and yet doing them in those small increments, then it becomes a habit. So what, like, what sort of time commitment do people, like a lot of people look for? Cause I, I don't know if you've seen the full swing. They actually have an episode of Wyndham Clark going in, like doing mental coach. That was a big part of the season last year. So I'm sure all of a sudden, you know, mental, the mental side is going to be, is at the center of full swing for like an entire episode. So awesome. like, what is like, what should people expect? Like, like how much time does it actually take? They do the assessment. They know exactly what they need to work at. Like, what's the commitment level for people to see results? Sure. I mean, let's just say the average player who maybe, and again, you're, I don't know who's listening here. Um, if we have a competitive player who can put in 15 to 20 hours of practice, that's obviously high level commitment per week. Right. Totally get it. Um, if I have somebody who's a 15 handicap, whose dream is to get a nine handicap and says, Rick, I want to try this. Um, and maybe they're only practicing two hours a week. I, I'm going to ask them to take a chunk of that, maybe 20 minutes on the range to go yeah. and look at full pre-shot routine and post-shot routine and work on visualization, do some random practice, variability practice, stuff like that. Pressure practice too is like put them in some stress states. Yeah. But I would do some stuff off of the golf course first. I would have them understand what proper breathing does for them physiologically, but also from a focus standpoint. So they have the skill already so then when they take it to the range then they take it to the course then they take it in a tournament it's already something that's been practiced yep. um journaling and and stuff like that's important too not only to kind of process what's going on but also to reinforce what's working we yep. can start seeing like oh, wow wow i was more calm there i was and so i don't think it's as big as what people think but i think just the awareness of oh there i go again my thought went to this and i'm oh coach rick talked about What's the last time I hit the shot? Well, oh yeah, yeah, I hit it last week here. Okay, cool. What? And now I can yeah. shift. That takes practice. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's not necessarily I need to do an hour of day, but you can start with five minute increments and then bleed it into a pre shot routine and then bleed it into that. Uh, that's how I like to do it. Now, yeah. when, when the, and I've worked with tour pros, is like, they're more of like, I got to get something done now. Yeah. <laughs> My livelihood's on the line here, Rick. Come on. And, and, and so you see, you may see them dive in with more gusto. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but then there's a lot of things and I have not seen the Wyndham Clark episode, so I don't want to speak on that, but I know a lot of these other players are utilizing mental game coaches for like life coaching and being able mm -hmm. to time manage and be able to deal yeah. with the stresses and the expectations that are having, that are happening in the world on them. Yeah that can affect our performance. And yeah. then there's other mental game uh, coaches that are just purely performance-based, what's happening in between the ropes, right? right. Um, I'm probably a little bit of both because I do believe yeah. that your uh, your life uh, is gonna affect your golf and vice versa. For sure. So what I'm hearing for everyone listening, is like, if you got five minutes of a day that you waste on social media, you can get better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, I, and, and, and just and just to clarify that people that are listening, Rick, I don't think there is just a regular random golf like fan listening to a golf fitness performance podcast. I think these are all pretty from from everyone I've talked to. It. These are you pretty serious it. golfers. They're they're yeah. they're playing a couple times a week. Like these are, sure. you know, the, if you're listening to this, you are the type of person who definitely needs the mental side. So, uh, you know, Rick, if if you can leave, you know, one last thought for people like like uh, i don't know i don't want to say a tip but like a takeaway sure. from the conversation that they really kind of wish people would kind of internalize and, and move forward with yeah i i think with the mental side is that i want to empower people that they have choices and it starts with self-awareness i'm aware right now that i'm distracted i'm aware right now i'm nervous i'm fine 
Now, the awareness is the first superpower, everybody. Okay. Now, some people make three bogeys in a row. They're they're frustrated and they look back and go, huh, how'd that happen? I was mad for three holes. Like, whoa, you should have been very aware <laughs> on the first shot that you were yeah. frustrated, right? So self-awareness, let's work on that. Let's understand what am I thinking, feeling, and doing right now, okay? If I'm not in the state I want to be, making the shift then becomes step two. Now, that shift can be I can think about something in a different way. I can use physiological uh, breathing. I can use my body differently. There's a bunch of different triggers, but you do have control over your how you feel. OK, and I really want to empower people. It's like, well, I always get mad because I'm playing with the slow play and that always gets me mad. Yeah. I go, OK, that's on you. OK, because yeah. guess yeah. what? Slow play is going to be here forever and you're yeah. going to play with it's people you don't anymore. like. Yeah. And you don't like the bumpy greens and you can give me all the excuses you want, but you have a choice. And so I yeah. really want people to understand they have a choice in how they feel. And yes, it, sometimes it takes a, a lot of work. And I, I, I think I know a lot. And sometimes I still get frustrated yep. on the golf course that's that's normal but how much is it affecting you now is is super important so awareness empower you can make a change um but yeah let's be let's 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 take some more responsibility for our our actions for sure i love that well rick uh where can people find you where's the best place for them to go after well obviously we'll put everything in the show notes but uh the person who right now is like all right i got five minutes i want to do it like <laughs> where how do they get in contact with you awesome. and, and get some help yeah no thank you um so the web, the easiest website is flowcode.golf, flowcode.golf. It has all, uh, we do certifications for coaches. We've got certainly uh, for players. We've got junior academy. We got, we're very, very um, uh, motivated to, to help every type of golfer out there. Um, and then on Instagram, we certainly have flowcode golf academy, but uh, Rick Sessinghouse is on Instagram and um, that, we, we do a lot of video based stuff there. Uh, and my website also ricksessinghouse.com um, has some other information on there, but I uh, really appreciate uh, the the opportunity to share. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Rick. And thank you everybody for hanging out with us on the bomb squad. Hopefully Rick has diffused a little bombs and dropped some, uh, dropped some, some knowledge bombs on you, but uh, hopefully we've, uh, we've, we've diffused the next blow up hole that you have coming because you're pissed off at your last hole. So thanks a lot, Rick. It's well, uh, been a pleasure having you on. I'm sure we'll have you on again uh, sometime awesome. soon. All right. Thank you.